I am really excited to get into today's video, guys, because the question I see on the forums more than any other question is, how do I keep my baby green tree python? How do I keep my yearling green tree python? How do you guys keep your adults? So what I'm going to do today is we're going to go through every stage. I'm going to make it really comprehensive. I'm going to make it really concise and to the point as far as temperatures, humidity, setups, everything you guys need to know. But before we do that, I want to talk about bio setups because I know people all the time talk about, hey, I would love to do a bio setup for my baby green tree python. And if you say that on the forums, everybody attacks you. Oh my God, no, no bio setups. But instead of me just saying to you, no, don't do a bio setup, I want to explain to you why you should not do a bio setup, especially if you're newer to green tree pythons. Um, it looks great, right? It looks far better than some of the setups I'm going to show you later as how I keep, how, you know, I keep my babies. But the bottom line, you see dirt, you see a plant, you see a stick. It looks beautiful. I love it. I love everybody's passion out there, the newer keepers coming up. Uh, they want to make it look somewhat like a fish tank, you know, they like all the live plants and the rock, and I, and I kind of, I get that entire concept. But the problem is that in order to keep the plant alive, you need to keep high humidity in the enclosure of the green tree python. Um, and if you do that, and you keep high humidity in a small space, a small amount of space, it's constantly going to be humid, and that's only going to lead to a respiratory infection with your green tree python. I promise you it's going to happen. It may take three months, it may take six months, eventually you're going to have a, a respiratory infection in your green tree python if you keep them in a, a small biological setup. And you can say, but what if I keep a screen cover? You notice there's a screen cover on here. Well, if you keep a screen cover on it, that helps with airflow, of course, and that's the most important thing, right? Humidity and airflow. Uh, the issue is that you will not be able to sustain, sustain enough humidity in the enclosure, okay? So um, as, as nice as it looks, um, it's, just, it's, it's just simply it's not going to work out. I'm trying to save you guys heartbreak from not doing a bio setup. And then people will say to me, you know, what about like zoos? Zoos have the green tree pythons and biological setups. But think of the size of the enclosures in zoos, right, guys? It's, it's a lot bigger. Uh, and there's more airflow, and that's what it's all about is airflow. Even if, even in a larger enclosure like that's commercially available to us as hobbyists, you know, 24-inch cubes or 36-inch enclosures, which I use, um, to do a biological setup, even in that size, it's too small. There's just not enough airflow, and not enough airflow combined with high constant humidity. You need constant humidity. The dirt's constantly going to be damp, right, for the plants. That's going to lead to a respiratory infection. So when people talk about bio setups, um, what you should really do is first master keeping green tree pythons. Keep them for minimally six to eight years. And then once you get to learn that animal and really how to keep that animal, then you could think about possibly going towards a biological setup. Okay, so case in point of what I'm talking about, guys. As you can see, this is a fish tank stand. If you guys follow my channel, I, I mentioned six months ago, I'm getting a discus set up. Well, I ordered my tank like back in November. I still do not have my tank. Everybody's so behind right now because of, you know, COVID is what they tell me. But anyway... It's like a 125 gallon tank, custom tank, and I am going to keep discus. That is my dream to keep discus. I've kept fish for 20 years more, but I've never kept discus. I would love to keep discus with live plants, but what I know just from speaking with enough people that it's really difficult to keep both live plants and discus together just due to the different parameters of the heat that's required. Specifically, discus love higher temperatures, right? 83, 84 degrees. And most plants cannot tolerate that high of a temperature. So theoretically, you're either going to do a detriment to the fish if you keep the temps too low, or you're going to do a detriment to the plant if you keep the temperatures too high. And that reminds me of green tree pythons. It's like, what I'm first going to do is master how to keep discus. Well, master, I don't know if I'll be able to ever master keeping them, but I'm going to really try to nail down everything with discus over the next few years. And if I feel like I have them going really well and really strong, at that point, I might try to introduce some live plants. But again, that's what I was saying to you guys earlier. If you want to mess around and you know keep chondros six, six plus years and really try to understand the animals, their behavior, the parameters of what they require as far as heat and humidity, and then try a bio setup, well, then, okay, go ahead and try it. But again, even under those circumstances, uh, I just think you are setting yourself up, unfortunately, for heartbreak. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to say about this is I am fully against biological setups unless you have some amazing, huge setup, like a zoo-type setup with heavier flow. Um, but if you guys don't want to listen to me and you don't want to do what I'm going to show you later in this video, I admit the, the enclosures I'm going to show you for my chondros are nowhere as sexy as a biological setup. But again, if you want to go against everything I'm telling you and you're just like, hey, I can figure this out, I want to do a biological setup, the only thing I can suggest to you is when you buy one of these spades, make sure you buy one with a, a handle that's nice and soft because I just don't want you guys to hurt your hand when you're burying your chondros. Welcome to video number 34, everybody, and I am so excited to get into today's video. But first, I gotta tell you, anybody else concerned out there that we're about to get into World War III? I mean, you guys know what's going on between Kanye West and Pete Davidson, right? God, it's just so scary. Anyway, hey, before we keep going forward, trap talk. 
uh, podcast, my boy MJ out there. If you don't listen to MJ's podcast, Trap Talk podcast, you should start listening to it. I got to tell you, every single time I am cleaning enclosures down here, I always have MJ's podcast on. I love it. I just love the one, especially when he had Dave Kaufman on. I learned so much about it. If you're a ball python person, especially listen to that one. Dave is a pretty cool documentary uh, that's going to be coming up. But um, anyway, I got a chance to meet MJ in uh, the October Tinley Show. And I just love the guy. And I love his passion. And he loves these animals. And it really comes out in his podcast. So if you're not listening, make sure you listen to MJ's podcast. And, you know, one quick pro tip before we jump into today's video. You guys are always asking me. Yeah, what, is those, what are those pieces between your cages? And you asked me if I ordered them from the cage manufacturer themselves. No, I'm going to show you what I do right now, guys. It cost me about $10. All it is is black poster board from Michael's Craft Store. I just cut it to size. You can see it's white on the back. I take Velcro. I put a little piece of Velcro on each top, Velcro on the cages. And I do it because you can see all the wires right now. And I just don't want to see the wires. So I just take these little cheap pieces of paper. I attach them to the Velcro. And... operate when I want them to, and just like that, the wires are gone. So if you guys have that problem at home, just get yourself from a poster board from Michael's Craft Store. You can hide them. So what's the goal of today's video? The goal is I want to take you guys from baby green tree pythons all the way up to adults. I want to tell you, show you guys temperatures, humidity, substrates, um, cage sizes, and I want to just take you and hopefully answer any questions you guys might have and clear up any confusion that might be out there. So why don't we start with babies? So what are we looking at right here? These happen to be Maniquari chondros. These were captive hatch babies over in Indonesia. Um, there were about, I want to say, nine in the entire clutch. I was able to get seven of them. They're all yellow babies. And let's look at the setups. First off, you're going to hear the name David Brahms a lot today. All these purchases are by David Brahms. This is a traditional shoebox setup. That's all it is. I use a wet paper towel as a substrate. Every single morning, I spray these babies down, okay? But again, people always ask, too, where should I have the heat tape? Should it go on the back of the shoebox rack, or should it go underneath the tubs? Honestly, guys, it really doesn't matter. As long as you can have a place where you don't have to keep your water bowl on top of the heat tape. So I keep... The water bowls towards the front of the enclosures. The heat is in this particular rack, is in the back. This is a Jeff Ronnie Boafile plastic shoebox rack. Unfortunately, Jeff uh, Ronnie of Boafile no longer makes this rack. These shoeboxes are no longer made, so I'm showing you some older stuff, but the bottom line is any shoebox will work, okay? So these are the purchase made by David Brom, Specialty Enclosure Designs. I will put a... a um, a link on the bottom of this video so you can reach out to David Brahms, one of my purchaser from David, and I love them. Could you get a coat hanger and use them for like 99 cents? Of course you could. It's always funny to me because as conjurer breeders, we're like, we'll spend thousands of dollars on an animal and put them on a, a 99 cent coat hanger, but it is effective and it does work. And as far as the substrate, you, get, you guys can see, I use paper towels, a substrate that is just, I spray it down every single morning, lightly spray each animal every single morning. I spray directly on the animal, and then by the end of the day, it completely dries out. Some people tend to keep their chondros over water, or baby chondros over water. That is also effective. I don't do that because baby chondros tend to defecate and spread urates almost every other day, and you'd be constantly cleaning and scrubbing these boxes every other day, so I found it more effective if I just, for baby chondros, I use the uh, paper towel, damp paper towel on the bottom. Temperatures in this enclosure, guys, are 81 to 83 degrees. Animals this size, I'm feeding, uh, again, these are about two months old. They're all getting small pinky mice. I feed them like every five to six days because at this age, I'll tell you, they burn through food. And why do I spray them down every morning? Well, I spray them down because it gets the humidity up in the enclosure, but more importantly, humidity and hydration help baby chondros prevent them from uh, prolapsing because that is a big problem with baby chondros. They tend to prolapse. We know now, after keeping them for many years, that really prolapsing occurs for two reasons. The first is dehydration, and the second thing is it comes from eating pinky mice, because a pinky mouse or a pinky rat, pinky rat would be too big for these babies, but there's no substance to a pinky mouse, right? Um, it creates almost a loose stool, but commercially available, we don't have many options where we can feed baby green tree pythons, so we have to feed them pinky mice, and we feed them... Um, you know, fuzzy mice as they get bigger. Fuzzy mice are far better because there's cartilage with a fuzzy mouse and there's fur and there's just more roughage in the animal's diet. And when there's more roughage, it just tends to create or it just really helps prevent any prolapsing. So again, 
uh, we're going to keep them hydrated because we, we don't have much of a choice as far as what we can feed them. We're going to feed them pinky mice, but we can at least help prevent the prolapsing by spraying them down, misting them every day. Because remember, in the wild, what do these guys eat? They'll eat small frogs and they'll eat small lizards. Both of those animals have cartilage, they have bone matter to them, so at least when these animals defecate, it's not as runny, right? Because there is some roughage in their diet. So, um, again, 81 to 83 degrees. I spray these animals around directly every morning. I keep a little water bowl in the front. I feed them every five, six days pinky mice. And this is basically how these guys are going to sit for, I'll tell you, the first 8 to 12 months of their life. So your baby chondro is now four months old. So all these guys are now four months old and they are eating fuzzy mice. Um, for you newer keepers out there of arboreals, I would, I would suggest highly that you do not even acquire a baby green tree python until it's minimally four to six months old. At that point, I would say it's established because even those babies I showed you earlier, sometimes they'll eat, sometimes they won't. They still take a lot of uh, teasing. And uh, one of those little babies actually had prolapsed on me not that long ago. It's perfect now, but um, if you get unestablished babies, it could be uh, problematic if you're a newer keeper. So again, this size is four months old, and I would highly advocate getting animals that are minimally four to six months old. But you can see, it's the same exact setup, guys. They're in the same rack. It's a baby rack. Those same purchase by David Brahms. David can make those purchase for you. Any size enclosure you have, you tell him exactly what you need. David can make them. You go to his website, and you'll see them all, uh, what's available. Again, damp paper towels, a substrate. Water bowls in the front. The, on the high end, we're talking 83 degrees. Towards the front of the container, it's probably 80. But overall, you're talking 81 to 83 degrees. I find those temperatures to be perfect. You might speak with somebody who says they don't miss their chondros down in the morning. Or you might speak with somebody who keeps their animals at 85 degrees. And maybe that works for them, and that's great. I am not saying what I am doing is the only way, but this, is, this works best for me. And uh, it's been really effective for me, so I'm going to continue down this path of 81 to 83 degrees with the misting in the morning. And at this size, guys, again, they are on fuzzy mice. And I love once they're on fuzzy mice because the uh, probability of them prolapsing once they're on fuzzy mice, even though it's a larger meal, because there's the fur on them and the bone, uh, it's just it's just less of a chance that they're going to prolapse at this age. However, I still have the humidity going and increase the humidity by spraying them every morning because uh, I don't want to take that chance. So again, higher humidity. And by the end of the day, even though I spray them in the morning, uh, they, each of these enclosures, these small enclosures, will uh, dry out by the end of the day. So again, these are four to six, these are four month old animals, but again, I would say from from a baby up until eight months old, you can keep them in these little shoe boxes. They, it maintains high humidity. You can manage your parameters really easy because it's so small. The animals thrive. They shed in one piece, and uh, it's just a great way to uh, keep your young baby green tree pythons. Hey, guess what? That baby conjurer you got a year ago is now a yearling because it's kicking butt because you guys watch my videos. You know exactly how to raise them. So with that in mind, let's see. This is what a this is exactly a 12-month-old, a one-year-old green tree python. That's a, that was a, a red a baby. That's a pure manaquari animal. So how do I have it set up? Well, for a yearling, you know what I want to show you guys really quickly? Look at the difference, how much they grow. That's exactly four months old. And that's exactly one year old. So you can see, uh, even though they don't grow as quickly as some other species, they put on some size pretty quickly in that first year. And you can see the difference in the perch size as well, which is really important. We'll talk about that shortly. But anyway, here you have a 12-month-old, a one-year-old green tree python. And now he's in a bigger tub. This is a cambro tub. You may have difficulty finding these cambro tubs right now. I'm not sure. But um, actually, you know what? I believe Focus Cube Habitats, in fact, I'm positive, my memory serves me correctly, they're making a rack now with these Cambro tubs, and it's perfect for yearling retreat pythons. And as you can see, even though the enclosure is bigger and I change the substrate out, here I use water. So why do I use water on the yearling as opposed to the babies? Well, the babies, as I mentioned, they tend to uh, defecate and spread urates more readily, and there's more constant you know, scrubbing every other day because um, you don't ever want them drinking water that they, they fouled up. But with these animals at this size, this animal will defecate or spread urates maybe once a week, you know, maybe once every 10 days. An animal this size, I'm also feeding once a week at this, at this size. Every seven days, it's feeding, it's getting a small mouse. Uh, but again, it's the same parameters as the shoebox I showed you earlier, even though it's bigger. Everything, it goes from 81 to the back is 83 degrees, because on this particular rack, the heating goes in the back. And as far as perching, so now we're going to move up in size and perching. But again, I know I'm talking about David Brahms all the time and specialty enclosure designs, but I love them because 
He'll make a perch like this for me, and he can make them for you as well. And it gives the animal a choice. There's three different size perches on here. And as you can see, the animal tends to go to the smallest perch. They love smaller perches, guys. When in doubt, if you're looking at perches, always pick the smaller perch. They want to feel secure. They want to wrap around the entire perch. They don't want to rest on top of the perch, okay? They actually want to wrap around it. Because if you see your animal that he's on top of the perch, almost sitting on top of it, and his, his body's not touching, you can see on this one... His body is actually touching on the bottom. That's a perfect size perch for him. He feels so secure. If there's a lot of spreading where he's sitting more on top of the perch, I would really suggest um, getting a smaller uh, in diameter perch. That's really important. But again, so here's your yearling animal set up 81 to 83 degrees. And really quickly, I want to show you, if you don't want to go with the cane row rack, which is totally fine, they tend to be a little bit pricier. Here's a traditional. This is a 12 core, but they make them in 15 core as well. Um, Rubbermaid tub. This is also really effective. Again, I have a perch by David Brown, special that fits especially in this particular tub. The water bowl is in the front. It is away from the heat. And this particular rack, the heat uh, stays towards the back. But it would be 81 towards the front, 83 towards the back. Uh, the animals thrive under that. I keep them on damp paper towel. Again, my preference is the Cambro rack. That's why I have it. But again, damp paper towel, I would... When I missed it down every morning, I would miss it, but I wouldn't miss the animal. Once they hit about a year old, I would not miss the animal directly. At that, I mean, you can. There's no downside to it, but I would miss the back of the enclosure where the heat is by the paper towel because that will increase your humidity. And by the end of the day, that humidity will dry out. Just like if you think about the rainforest, it tends to be really wet in the morning, and by the end of the day, it dries out. I'm trying to duplicate that same thing in a tub. There's also air holes in this for some airflow. Um, but either one of these for a yearling size animal is perfect. So again, for the first one to eight months of its life, we're going shoebox. Once you hit that eight month mark around that area, then we're going to go into a Cambro tub or we're going to go into a 12 to 15 quart tub. Either paper towel, damp paper towel is a substrate, 81 to 83 degrees, one small mouse every seven days. And uh, that's pretty much it. So why don't we go now to a 18 month old animal. Okay, so I lied. I said 18 months. This girl's actually 17 months old, okay? She's still going through her on a color, uh, on a genetic color change. She's pretty much done with it, but um, she's still going to get a little different over the next six months. I'll have to revisit her in another video, but she's a female. She's captive bred and born by me. She's a red manaquari. So what size perch am I keeping this animal on right now? This is a three quarter inch perch, and I think that's perfect for a animal that's, uh, once it hits about that, you know, 18, as I said, she's 17 months, but about that 18 month mark. And as you can see, underneath that, guys, her, her folds are touching, her body's touching each other, right? It's not like she's resting on top of the perch, she's actually curled tightly around that perch. And as I mentioned in one of my videos, the reason that's so important is if you put an animal, green tree python, on a perch that's too big, um, you're going to get indentations by the tail, tail depressions they're called, and I'll have to link that video on the bottom of this one. So everything I tell you guys is for a reason. If I'm talking about perches being on the smaller side, I promise there's a reason I'm saying that. Okay, so this is a three-quarter inch perch. This is a 17-month old animal, and this is the enclosure I now have her in. I took her from the Cambro boxes after about a year, and I put her into her adult cage, and she's going to pretty much live out the rest of her life in this cage, although the perch size will get a little bit bigger. This is a 36 inch by a 24 inch by an 18 inch high enclosure. This is made by Jeff Roney over at Boafa Plastics. There is a radiant heat panel over here on this cage. Again, guys, the high end in this, in this cage right here is probably about, I'm going to say 83, 83.5, something in that area. On this end, this actually drops down to about 78 degrees. What am I using for a substrate? I am using Cocoa Chip as substrate. Do I love using a substrate with green tree pythons? No, guys, I actually hate it. I'm not joking with you. I hate using substrate with green tree pythons or any arboreals. However, I have substrate in all my young animals' cages and my adults. Why do I do it? Because without it, I have a lot of dry sheds, as I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate to that. The only way I can maintain the parameters I need for these animals is by using the Cocoa Chip and twice a week, I will just give it a good soaking. It'll dry out over the next 24 to 48 hours, but at least I know it's maintaining some humidity over those, uh, those periods where I am, you know, I am soaking down the cocoa chip. But it's nice because it just gradually loose, it loses its moisture, so it gradually loses some of the humidity in the cage. But to combat that, I also keep a very large 
uh, it's basically a cat line. It's basically a, a kitty litter pan. And I put a gallon of water in here, and I change these cages out minimally two times a week. I spot clean my animals every single day, and every three to four days, it's a lot of work, but I am changing out the uh, the water in these cages. And I'm scrubbing down these kitty litter tubs, and then what I not only do I scrub them down, I actually replace it with a brand new one. I have double the amount I need, so I can always replace them and never use the same one on the same day with the you know, same animal. So again, 81 to 83 degrees, rated heat panel on the hot spot, you're talking 83 degrees in here. On the cool end, you're talking about 78 degrees. Um, I'm keeping the cocoa chip to get the humidity up. Um, if you guys live in an area that's more moist than I am or, you know, with more humidity in the air, you don't need the cocoa chip. God bless you. I'm super jealous of you, but I don't have that luxury. And when I don't have, when I don't keep my cocoa chip on the uh, more damp side, um, I get a lot of dry shed. It's the only thing that saves me. Uh, an animal like that size, 17, 18 months old, I am feeding her uh, one adult mouse every seven days. And at this age, what's so nice is they, they burn through food from one to 18 months. This is when she'll start to slow down a little bit. So I take advantage of those growth spurts, which is why I feed my babies every five to six days. I feed my younger animals every six days. It's when about to hit the 18 month mark where I'll slow it down to about once every seven days. As adults, I'll feed them maybe once every two weeks. Um, so again, 78 degrees on the cool end, it's 83 degrees on the warm end, cocoa chip substrate, um, and I think that's pretty much it. So she's 18 month old, why don't we now, and again, I want to mention three quarter inch on the uh, perch size. I'm going to show you the perch sizes right here. This, these are all David Brahms perches, by the way. That's three quarter inch. That's a one inch perch size, and honestly, for an adult male chondro, you never really want to go bigger than an adult one inch, you're not going to need that. Uh, even most females will be fine at one inch. And I'll show you, you know, maybe if you have a really large animal, you can go one and a quarter inch. But for the most part, for adult chondros, you're either going to be using a three quarter inch perch or a one inch perch. I don't think you really ever need to go bigger than that. They're far more uh, secure, as I mentioned earlier, on the smaller perches. Um, so again, three quarter inch on that size. And now let's look at an adult animal. This is a seven-year-old female Manaquari green tree python that I produced. And those red baby Manaquaris I showed you earlier, those are some of her offspring from last year. So the same exact setup I showed you guys for that 18-month-old animal earlier, it's the same exact setup for her. Same size enclosure, same substrate, same everything. The only difference is with her, I feed her jumbo mice every, say, 10 to 14 days. I slow her down quite a bit. I don't feed rats. I never feed rats. I don't know as far as nutritional value, mice to rats, but we learned a long time ago green tree pythons. It's, it's just just better to feed them smaller meals more frequently than larger meals less frequently. They tend to digest them quickly, and which causes just less probability of a prolapse. Um, she is on a three-quarter inch perch. Even though I give her the, not, the option of having a three-quarter inch perch or a one-inch perch, each size would be perfect for her, uh, she chooses the uh, three-quarter inch perch. And the thing you're always going to notice about green tree pythons is... Well, we always taught, we always used to think that regardless of how many perches you put in, in, in an enclosure, um, they will always go to the highest perch. But what we really found out, I can't remember the gentleman's, name, the gentleman's name, I wish I could. He lives in Australia. He keeps his green tree pythons outside. And the cool thing we learned is that even though he had perches really high, his animals were always under the perches where he had some coverage by the way of ferns or some kind of plants. So what we come to learn is that green tree pythons necessarily they don't want to go to the highest perch but they love feeling secure they want to be under coverage and it just so happens that the highest perch tends to be near the top it's at the top of the cage where the, where the uh, top of the cage is and they feel that coverage it's almost like they're under a plant or a tree so i'd be willing to bet if you had some lower perches in an enclosure with some coverage of some plants they might use those perches as opposed to going to the top the top perch just because they're looking for that coverage i thought that was super interesting but again, nothing else different here, guys. Same size enclosure. And um, yeah, so the only thing that's changing between the 18-month-old and the adult green tree python is the frequency of meals and the size of meals. Other than that, the parameters are exactly the same. 83 on the high end under the radiant heat panel, and I got 78 on the cool end. Don't make yourself crazy with temperatures. If your temperature on the low end is 80 degrees as opposed to 78, or 77 as opposed to 78, don't freak out. It's fine. You'll figure it out, and the animals are fine. They're not that delicate. I mean, that they're going to freak out over a one or two degree uh, difference. The thing is about consistency. As long as it's not a constant fluctuation, uh, that could be problematic. But if you're consistent with your temps, even if they tend to be a little bit higher or a little bit lower, you're going to be fine. Hey, if you guys could do me a big favor and like my video and subscribe to my channel, I would really appreciate it. And also, you know what I want to hear below? I want to know who you guys would think would win in the fight. Pete Davidson or Kanye? Honey, who do you think would win, Kanye or Pete? Oh, 
I don't know. I think Pete should adjust his calendar and get back on that uh, space flight. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with you. I think Connie's got the crazy factor. I think Pete should be very scared right now. Hey, this is a reduced pattern diamond jungle jaguar carpet python. And at the risk of sounding like a ball python breeder right now, I have nothing against ball python breeders, but uh, I think this is the world's first, guys. I really do. It's a, uh, again, a reduced pattern diamond jungle jaguar. That's a female I produced last year. And as cool as she looks now, I am telling you about another six months when her color comes out, because her mother is incredible looking. Um, she's going to be really amazing. She's not only going to have that cool uh, pattern, but she's going to have some amazing bright yellow uh, coloration to her as well. And the really good news is the pair that produced her has been uh, breeding up a storm, and I think the female is about to ovulate, so hopefully I'll be able to produce some more of these next year. But anyway, listen, I hope you guys learned something in my video today. Um, if you have a difference of opinion of something I said, I'd love to hear about it, because as we all know, there's more than one way to be successful with green tree pythons. So if you're doing something different than I uh, am doing, I would love to hear about it. And uh, thank you again for watching, and I will see everybody in two weeks. Who has the best YouTube channel? Me?